Thanks, man. <laughs> Amen. Hey, Let me see. That's funny. Something happened in us spiritually, and we both saw that just there. Hey, good, good job, everybody. You're getting back to your seats after the lights flash. It feels like you're in a movie in the 50s, right? The lights are flashing and like means take your seats. The ushers are going to be by soon. Hey, um, so we're going to be in 1 Corinthians 3 today. Again, that's 1 Corinthians 3, and we're going to, our goal is to make it all the way through the whole chapter. So buckle your seatbelts because we're going to be, we're going to be moving today. Um, but before we get into the word, let's have a, a moment of prayer. Uh, Father, we thank you for what you're doing in our lives and in our church family here. We thank you for the letter to the Corinthians church. God, I love that your word is living and active, that you have breathed life into it, and even though this document is older than we can imagine, we can name the fact that it's thousands of years old, but it's hard to imagine something that old being alive and working in us. We pray, God, that you would be teaching us and growing us, that you'd be blessing us through your truth. Help our minds to grasp your truth and to wrestle with you so that we can grow, Father. We thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So my senior year in high school, I got really sick. I went to uh, some sort of a banquet and I ate some bad chicken. You ever do that before? And then it was like the opposite of the law of gravity. What goes up must come down. You get the picture, right? What goes down must come up. And so um, I spent over 72 hours not even uh, being able to drink in water. You know, I was really, really sick. Have any of you been that sick before? Um, I weighed 135 pounds at the time, and, and I was this height, okay, so just shrink me almost in half, and um, I lost 20 pounds over the course of those days. And so that happened on Sunday, and then Wednesday, I got like a lot better, and I went back to school, and I, at school, I walked in, and people like, you're gonna die. <laughs> I do? They're like, you... You look like a skeleton. They could see all of your bones. You could see your cheekbones. Your eyes are sunken in. Your hands are like kind of, you know, emaciated. And I was like, whoa, I didn't realize I was that sick. But there's a funny thing that happens to you when you're sick. You often can't see your way out of being sick. You just feel like death is there, sickness is there, and there's not a time that you're going to get better. Have you ever been there before? And that doesn't just happen to our physical bodies. Sometimes that happens to relationships, right? Where like you're in an important relationship and you're just like, how is this, how is this ever going to get any better? Yeah, sometimes you're like that in your job. And sadly, sometimes that can even happen in churches. And Paul is writing to the Corinthian church because they're unwell. Their church has gotten sick. It's not just a cold, it's not just the flu, it's dangerous. Their sickness is like cancer. There's division in the church, and the division doesn't start with the fact that they are divided from each other. Their division starts with the fact that they are divided from Christ. They've allowed themselves to become separated from him and his calling and his purpose and his work in their midst, and so they're finding other things to be loyal to outside of Jesus. 
So they're spiritually sick in a fundamental, a core way to the life of the church. Because what is a church without Jesus? It's not a church, right? It's just sort of a club, you know, Sunday morning happy club with songs and, and inspiring Pete speech. I mean, I don't, I don't know what you want to call it, but, but without Jesus, the church doesn't have a whole lot. He's the, he's the one who founded the church. He's the one who builds the church. He's the one who empowers the church. He's the one who gives the church his mission. Without Jesus, the church is bankrupt. It's dead before it knows it. And so Paul, in the beginning of the letter of Corinthians, before he gets to any of their concerns, because they, they wrote him and they said, hey, tell us how to deal with some of the things and the questions that we have. Before he deals with any of that, he's like, we got to deal with the main sickness. The things that you're concerned about aren't the big problem here. The big problem here is that you're separated from each other and you have a deep amount of sickness going on in your midst. But Paul wants to remind them and to us that God has bigger and better plans for us. When you're in this place where it doesn't feel like you are going to get past the thing that you're in, whether it's a physical sickness or a relational issue or a job that's not working out or, or even a church that's unwell, we need to keep in mind that what we're looking at is not all that there is. It might appear dire to you, but God is able. God is bigger and better, and he has bigger and better plans for you than the sickness that you see before you. How can I know this? How can you know this for a fact? Was there ever a time in history where things looked incredibly bleak and God demonstrated that the bleakness that was apparent was not what was really going on? Anybody have any source of hope or, you know, something that would help you escape death into life? Hey, that man there with the collar on, yes, sir, that's correct. Thank you for helping me out. The resurrection of Jesus Christ, right? Like, God raised his son from the dead, okay? Like, where did he raise him from? The dead, okay? Uh, can you do that? Can I do that? Does anybody know how long Jesus was dead for before he rose? Three days. Is that pretty dead? I'd say that's pretty dead. Anybody fi fish owners? Anybody have a fish tank when you were a kid? You ever come home and find the little fella kind of, whoop, you know, lopsided and not down at the bottom or the top? Did, did you leave him in there to see what was going to happen? No, why not? It's dead. There's not hope in death. But there is hope in Jesus. Jesus rose from the dead. He conquered sin and death. And for all who believe in him, he gives them eternal life, everlasting life. And that everlasting life, praise the Lord, is not a later thing. It's a now thing. It starts now and it goes on to later. And so the Apostle Paul is writing to this church and he's dealing with the heart of their sickness. He's exposing the difficulty that they're going through. He's not holding any punches, okay? He's not really being nice to them. This isn't niceanity. It's Christianity. And so he's putting Christ back in their church. And he's saying, guys, you're sick, but God wants you to be alive. He has bigger and better plans for you than the things that are going on in your midst. And so we're going to walk through that today, and we're going to discover what that looks like. Now, here's the thing. Here's the thing. The Corinthians are sick in specific ways, right? And Jesus is the one who has the medicine. He's the doctor who can heal. But sometimes other truths are needed. And so today, you might be figuring out, there's something that God has bigger and better plans for in my life, but the truth we covered today didn't discover it. It didn't expose the things that I needed in the midst of it. That's, that's what this thing is for. We're going to talk a little bit about that. But these are specific truths for the things that the Corinthians are dealing with. And some of these truths might apply to you. And some of them uh, might just give you understanding for later or maybe even to help somebody else. But let's, let's get into the word today. Let's go. Uh, for my part, brothers and sisters, I was not able to speak as, to you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as babies in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, since you were not ready for it. In fact, you are still not ready, because you are still worldly. For since there is envy and strife among you, are you not worldly and behaving like mere humans? For whenever someone says, I belong to Paul, and another, I belong to Apollos, are you not acting like mere humans? 
What then is Apollos? What is Paul? They are servants through whom you believed, and each has the role the Lord has given. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his own according to his own, own reward, according to his own labor. For we are God's co-workers. You are God's field, God's building. According to the grace that was given to me, I have laid a foundation as a skilled master builder. The word there is actually architect. And another builds on it. But each one is to be careful how he builds on it. For no one can lay any other foundation than what has been laid down. The foundation is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become obvious, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test the quality of each one's work. If anyone's work that he has built survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will experience loss, but he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Don't you know yourselves? Don't you yourselves know that you are God's temple? That the Spirit of God lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is holy, and that is what you are. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks he is wise in this age, let him become a fool so that he can become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. Since it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows that the reasonings of the wise are futile. So let no one boast in human leaders, for everything is yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come. Everything is yours, and you belong to Christ and Christ belongs to God. Amen. Yeah. It's the whole chapter. Wow, 23 verses. I miscounted. So we're going to unpack this chunk by chunk, uh, and I'm, I'm going to talk to you about truths that are in this passage uh, that, that we need to be thinking through. Uh, so starting at the beginning, Paul says, for my part, brothers and sisters, I was not able to speak to you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as babies in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, since you were not ready for it. In fact, you are still not ready, because you are still worldly. For since there is envy and strife among you, are you not worldly and behaving like mere humans? Wow. And like I said, Paul's, Paul's not pulling any punches. He doesn't feel like he's being kind, but he's being loving to the Corinthian church because he's exposing what's wrong, not to condemn, but to grow and to grow them up. Have you ever seen a big kid throw a temper tantrum? And you think to yourself, I thought this human was like 11. This looks like a two-year-old, really big two-year-old. Has that ever happened? Yeah. Have you ever had that happen in your adult life? Like something bad is going on and then you catch yourself having an adult tantrum and you're like, I thought this human was like 64. It's like a Beatles song, but I'm feeling like I'm two right now. You know, there's these moments in life where what we think we are is different than how we're acting in that moment. And then we realize in that moment that maybe there's some immaturity in us still that needs to get worked out. Has this happened to you? This week? Yeah, me too. Me too, right? If I'm really deeply honest about what's happening inside of me, well, Paul is telling this Corinthian church, you guys are kind of big babies. And that doesn't feel nice. Now, how, how many of you like babies? Yeah, I, I like babies. It's good. Babies are good, right? Like, it's, it's excellent. I mean, babies are, are actually psychologically good for communities. You, you need to have babies. When, when you hold a baby, you feel more alive. It's psychologically true. It tra- changes your brain, and something happens inside, and you have more neural activity. It, it, it's like an antidepressant in chubby little rolls and a diaper, right? You're like, I didn't know life was like this again. I didn't realize it. It's, you're made that way by God to enjoy new life happening around you. And you know what? Churches need babies too. But churches also need mature people. 
It's not fitting for us all walk, walk, to be walking around and being spiritually immature. The church is a place for people of all ages and stages of spiritual growth, and God has plans to grow you and change you. But sometimes something happens to us, and we get stuck in our development there. And then we don't keep growing. We cease to follow Jesus and the things that he's calling us into. And then this thing happens in our spiritual life. We become stagnant. We become stagnant. Uh, Have you ever seen a stagnant pond? How's that? Not good. What color is it? Green, brown. How's it smell? Mmm, yeah. Gotta love the pond funk, right? Like one one year I was visiting my parents and um, dad was like, I'm so glad you're here. We're gonna clean out our koi pond this week. (laughs) Oh, that was delightful. Everything I wore for that two days went in the trash. Okay, there was stagnant pond funk that was not, everything got bleached twice. I mean, everything got bleached twice, even me. Uh, And the clothes, they still... They still had the funk of the death of leaves and all that decaying matter that we were cleaning out. And that, that's what happens in stagnation. There's, there's death that starts to creep in. There's disease that starts to creep in. And so Paul is exposing, hey, your lack of growth, your immaturity is a real problem for you. This happens to Christians too. There's no such thing as matriculation in the Christian faith. This isn't a union where like time on the job equals more significance more seniority. It, it doesn't work that way. You have to grow spiritually. H- have you ever met someone who's half your age and you're like, man, they are so mature in the Lord. And then you meet somebody who's like twice your age and you're like, man, what is going on there? You know, and you're, you're not trying to be condemning, but you just realize the development that you expected in this seasoned saint doesn't match the development that you see in this youth. Now, now, certainly, some of this is expectations, right? Because we don't expect young people to be very mature, right? And we expect older people to be very mature. It's just something that we desire. It's this inherent orientation inside that with age should come maturation. But the reality is, is it doesn't always work that way. And so Paul is exposing to them, you guys think you're so awesome, you're, you're great philosophers, you're following amazing teachers, but the truth is, is you're still immature in your faith. He says you're still worldly, and he gives us some markers of immaturity. So immaturity is marked by a lack of readiness for solid food. So immaturity, how, how ready are you for solid food? He says, I gave you spiritual milk because you are not ready for solid food. Now, really quickly, if this is a new concept for you, the Bible talks about truth that's in it, like food that's meant to nourish you. It's a recurring theme in the Bible. One time God told his prophet, he he, he made a really small scroll of his word, and he said, I want you to eat this word, right? Like, I, I want this to go inside of you and transform you like food does. Because what happens to your food? It becomes part of your body, right? Like you break it down and it becomes you. Some of us have been really transformed by food, right? And some of us um, are not as transformed by our food, and, and that's, that's okay. But you, you really literally are transformed by everything that you eat. It becomes part of you in so many ways. And Paul is saying, you weren't ready for the main course. I was just giving you the milk. Now, spiritual milk is good, right? In fact, Peter says that he longs for his churches to desire spiritual milk like newborn babes, okay? Now, I did not understand this until I saw my newborn babes longing for milk, and I was like, I'm staying out of the way of that, you know? There's an intensity of seeking after milk in infants, you know? It's like that's all that's going to satisfy them. It's absolutely what they need. They're like gaga over it, literally, in every sense. Uh, it, it's like they're little addicts. It's crazy. And, 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 and Peter is saying, you, you need to long for milk in that way. But, but Paul is saying, don't just be satisfied with the milk. You need the meat. You need solid food. What does milk do to those babies? Makes them fat, right? Fat and happy. It's good. It's good. It causes growth. But if you only have the milk, you know what happens? You just stay fat, Okay. 
And, and some of us, we are really big, roly-poly, fat, chubby baby Christians. And, and just like fat, chubby babies, we get crabby because, well, you, did, you didn't sing the songs I liked at church today. And the coffee was too hot or the coffee was too cold or, or, or all these, you know, there, there, there's complaining that happens and there's, there's an inability to be productive that happens and there's a reticency to move forward that happens. And they, they need other people to serve them always. They're not really following Jesus. And, and I know this is hard because... I've probably been there in seasons in my life. Maybe you have too. But Paul is saying you need to be ready for solid food. Now also I want to talk about what solid food really is. See, sometimes we get a twisted mindset about what good teaching is. Now sermons are a challenging thing to give because in this congregation we have everything from new Christians of all ages to seasoned saints and people who don't even know Jesus yet. And something needs to happen in this time for every one of these people, right? It needs to connect with all of them. Now, praise the Lord that that's not all on me because his word is powerful and active. But what it means is that not everyone is going to get fully satisfied in every meal. It's a little bit of a buffet, right? But that doesn't mean that there's not deeper things in every message. See, sometimes getting to the meat means that you have to chew, you ever notice the kids don't like steak? But they like hamburger. You know why? They don't like to chew. Their jaw gets tired. My kids have literally complained about this. Now, we, I've done the classic thing, don't wait to the end of the meal to eat your meat. Cold meat is tough. Hot, fresh meat is juicy and good, right? And so they're learning that, and my oldest boy is finally liking steak. He gets excited when the steak hits the table, and it gets eaten first most of the time. But the younger one, man, that is beef bubble gum stays in that mouth way too long his jaw gets tired he can't chew the food he can't digest it you know spiritual meat has to be digested you need to chew on it you need you need to be grumming for a while that's this is process of meditating and thinking about it and studying it uh, by the way what happens if you just swallow the meat what's going to happen to you tummy ache right it's not going to not going to sit so well you really have to digest it it's not just, though, digesting it that matters. It's digesting it for a purpose. You remember the, that Jesus told the Pharisees, you have searched the Scriptures looking for Messiah, but you don't understand them because I am here, right? He's like, Messiah is here, but you're not getting it. It's not just Bible knowledge that matters. It's biblical transformation. And when Paul is talking about the deeper things of Christianity, he's talking about things like Philippians 2, which is the passage that talks about Jesus emptying himself and humbling himself. And Paul says, have the mindset in you that was in Christ Jesus. Although he existed in equality with God, he did not consider his godness, his godhood, as something that he should use for his own advantage. Instead, he emptied himself and he, of himself. He got rid of his own desires and he took on the Father's desires. He became obedient even unto the point of death. And not just any death, death on a cross. The king of the world became the greatest slave of the world. This is the meat of Christianity, that you and I are made in God's image and are made to reflect the glory and character of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. It's not just how much Bible do I know, but how much Jesus do I know? And how much does my life look like him? look like what he did. These are the deeply spiritual things that Paul is talking about. When you look at the letters that Paul was pouring into people who were growing, that's what he was calling them to. He was calling them to Christ-likeness. You'll notice that Paul never said, therefore, memorize your Bible every day. No, he says, therefore, be imitators of Christ. Take off the old self. Put on Jesus. It's all about this deeper transformation and when we're immature, that deeper transformation is not happening. Paul also says that immaturity is marked by perspectives 
shaped by the world and values shaped by the world as seen in non-Jesus-like behavior. He tells them that they have envy and strife going on. They're jealous of each other. They're trying to one-up each other. They're trying to figure out who is the best in the church. Who's the most important in the church? Who matters? Who matters in the church? Jesus. Who else matters in the church? Everybody. Everybody. I was hanging out with a friend a little while ago, and he shared this amazing life philosophy with me. He says, I don't, I don't like this all life matters thing. He says, it, it, it doesn't really talk about it the way God does. He says, each life matters. If I say all life matters, it says in general this principle of life is important. But to Jesus, every life matters. Each person in the church is significant. But the one who is most significant is absolutely Jesus. And so in trying to be better than each other, the Corinthians each are making themselves not just above each other, but above Jesus. Or their teachers above Jesus. And their teachers above them. Paul's going to share in a minute why that's wrong why that's incorrect. The world before the cross is flat. The world before the cross is flat. We're all equal in Christ. So they had envy and they had strife. They were fighting each other. They were arguing with each other. The community of Christ is designed by God. The DNA is there to be marked by unity. Paul writes elsewhere, guard the bond of peace among you, the unity of the Holy Spirit that you have. He's saying treat it like Fort Knox. One of the most precious things in a church is unity. In a world that is constantly marked by division and wars and strife, unity is a marker of love. It's a marker of the power of Jesus that is uniquely available in His church. It's why it's such a major catastrophe when there's division of any sort in a church. We should be running to each other to unite in love when difficulty comes up, not fighting each other to see who's going to win. How unfortunate it is when that happens. It it does happen, right? And we've all heard the jokes about churches splitting over the color of carpet, but churches split over silly things. Do you know why? Satan loves to cause disunity in the church. He really loves to cause disunity among God's people because then it covers over the love of Jesus. It just puts a blanket over the love that's forming there. It's like hiding the light of Jesus under some sort of a bushel basket. I think there's a scripture verse about that, but but, um, it's important that we recognize that our values and perspectives are to be shaped by Jesus' values and perspectives. And, And envy, so jealousy of each other and fighting aren't the only thing that can go wrong. There can be greed, there can be laziness, there can be arrogance and pride. Oh, we're better than other churches because we have a such and such and we do this and that. You know, all of these different identities outside of Jesus are worthless and they're, they're a waste compared to knowing Christ and making him known. And so Paul is trying to say your values and perspectives are off and it's, it's being shown in your behavior. You know, the proof is in the pudding. The proof is in the pudding. Your fruit will be evident, Jesus says. You will be known by what? Your love. That's how you'll be known as disciples. Now, not all disciples make it there. Sometimes we stay spiritual infants and we stay self-focused instead of being Jesus-focused. And then Paul says, finally, he says, you're walking like mere men. Now, that's a, that's a funny phrase. We don't really get the meaning because it doesn't work, but, but Paul is saying, you're slaves. This was a, a slave in Corinth that, that meant that you were, or this is a statement in Corinth that meant that you were a slave, walking according to a man. That means somebody else is your boss. Remember I shared at the beginning of the sermon series how Corinth was a city of freed men, meaning they they were not slaves in the Roman culture. There There were three classes of people in the Roman culture. There were citizens, there were freed men, and there were slaves. And all of these people in Corinth that Paul's writing to, well, the majority are not just slaves. They become freed men, and so they've moved up in society. And Paul is saying, you guys aren't acting like you've been freed by Jesus. You're actually living in slavery still. 
You're in bondage to the ways that you used to live. You're just like the world around you. He says, but God has bigger plans for you than the sickness that is in your midst. Now, there's just a a note that I want to make here, and I, I hope that you'll take this on and embrace this, okay? God accepts you just as you are. You don't have to change your behavior for God to accept you. You don't have to become a better person. That's not what this is all about. We're not forming a cultural Christianity where we measure the value of other people based on their behavior. It would be twisting this passage completely. Paul is writing to them because Jesus loves them. Remember the beginning of the chapter? I rejoice. Why do I rejoice? Because you are saved. Because that means that Jesus is in you and working in you, and he's not going to give up working in you until he's done. And so I rejoice because Christ's presence and power is in your midst. God accepts you just as you are. He's not running away from you. He has bigger and better plans for you than immaturity. And so if you're hearing this today, and you're feeling the Holy Spirit kind of do surgery in your heart, Know that it's not condemnation that's being brought. It's salvation that's coming in. God wants to grow you and transform you. He has better plans for you than the places that you're immature. He wants you to know him. He wants you to be healed by him in every way. I also want us to remember that God matures us by changing our minds so that they align with his mind. So God matures you by changing your mind so that it aligns with his mind. It doesn't start with changing your behavior. It doesn't start with changing your behavior. It starts with God changing your mind. Remember in the last chapter, he ended and he said, but we have the mind of Christ. He's setting that out as the standard for us. It it doesn't matter what Apollos thinks or Paul thinks or any other teacher. You know what really matters is what Jesus thinks. It doesn't matter what I think. It matters what Jesus thinks. And so our whole goal here is to expose the mind and heart of Jesus so that that mind and heart will impact our mind and heart. And Paul continues, he says, for whenever someone says, I belong to Paul, and another, I belong to Apollos, are you not acting like mere humans? What then is Apollos? What then is Paul? They are servants through whom you believed, and each has a role the Lord has given. Wow, did you catch that? Paul's giving the Corinthian church shifts in mindsets. So mindset shift number one, every person who teaches or disciples you is a servant. God is the master. Every person who teaches or disciples you is a servant. God is the master. You know, it's it's really tempting to, to puff up the name of teachers and worship leaders and other people who serve Jesus and expose his heart to you in a big way, who help you fall in love with Jesus and know Jesus more. But as one of these people who seeks to do this in other people's lives, I just want to tell you, I would way rather that you tell people about what Jesus is doing in your life than for you to say something like, man, Pastor Chris gave a great sermon today, you know? I I like hearing that in my flesh, but honestly, what does it matter how big Pastor Chris is at PBC or anywhere in the world? It doesn't matter. Whose name do people need to know? Jesus' name. Who do they need to know will save them? Jesus, absolutely. Absolutely. I want to be a church where people are like, Jesus is doing awesome things. Do you know how that happens? That happens when we start talking about how Jesus is changing us, how he's transforming our lives. It's not about Joel and the worship team. It's not about me. It's not even about you. It's about Jesus and what he is doing. So Paul says, every person who teaches you is a servant Every person who disciples you is a servant. Every person who blesses you is a servant. Every person who shows you the way, they're just servants. Jesus is the master. God is the master. He's the one who put them on assignment to you, right? He's the one who gave it. When when you have a package that's arrived from someone that you love and it gets dropped off on your porch and you're not home, do you call UPS to say thank you for the package? Who do you call? You call the sender of the package, right? That's what Paul is exposing to us here. You're thanking the wrong person. It's not me that matters. It's not Apollos that matters. We're just slaves, guys. We're just slaves of Jesus. We're just doing what he tells us to do. Jesus is the one who matters. He is the master. He is the one who sent us to you, so thank him. Paul says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything. What does that mean they are? Nothing. It just means that we're a whisper. We're just a page in the book. 
that Jesus is the book. It's hard to embrace that, right? It's, it's hard to say, compared to Jesus, my ministry and my message is nothing. But it's true. It's very, very true. The mindset that he's calling them into, he's saying, you are the recipient and God causes the growth. You are the recipient and God causes the growth. I, I love hearing this in church uh, and I've felt it before. It's like you were speaking just to me. And I think, praise the Lord, because that's what the Holy Spirit does. He speaks to each of you in what he is sharing. He wants to bring about growth in your life. That's why I'm here. It's why he called me to be here. I'm not here so that you would know me. I'm here so that you would know Jesus. And he is the one who is growing you. Last week after church, I, I saw a sister in Christ at the door. I saw lots of sisters in Christ at the door. And I asked her how she was doing. And she says, I am amazing. I'm amazing because my spirit is growing here. My spirit, and I thought, praise the Lord. God is growing this person in our midst. God is causing the growth. It's important for, for us to remember that God causes the growth. It's God who causes the growth. It's very important for us to embrace that and hold on to that because what happens if we don't do that is we, we make these false allegiances. We decide that this teacher is bigger than that teacher. This one is more important. You know, I, I've heard so, so many things like, America needs a Billy Graham. And I think Billy Graham is like, no, no, the whole point of what I did wasn't so that you would think Billy Graham is saving America. Who does America need? Jesus. And I'm not, I'm not preaching this because I just want revival in America. I just want us to be really clear. We don't need a better politician. We don't need a bigger preacher. We just need Jesus. And the more Jesus is working in us, the more we talk about the growth, the more contagious that growth is. And so let's get it right. God causes the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's workers, God's co-workers, and you are God's field, God's building. Mindset shift number three. You are God's co-worker and God's cause. You are God's co-worker and God's cause. Okay, if you have put your faith in Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit has gifted you with at least one unique spiritual gift that is yours. And that Holy Spirit wants to work with you and through you on this earth to do eternally great things. Okay? You are God's co-worker. You're not doing it for God. You're doing it with God. So if you have the gift of service and you're serving other people in Jesus' name, you're not serving on your own. You're serving with God. If you have the gift of encouragement and you see someone is down and you're just writing them a note, just reminding them that God loves them and thinks they're special and sharing some of the encouragement from God's heart to their heart, you're not writing that note alone. Who's writing it with you? Jesus is writing it with you, right? If you're correcting someone, if you're raising someone out of sin so that they're not stuck and hurting anymore, who's doing that with you? If you're at the door greeting someone and you're sharing your joy in Christ in Jesus' name with them, who are you doing that with? Jesus. If you're up here on the stage helping lead worship because your heart desires to magnify God and you want this congregation and the world to see Jesus and worship Him like you do in your heart, who are you doing that with? Amen. You're doing it with Jesus. You are God's co-worker. Isn't that incredible? Isn't that crazy? I mean, that is absolutely nuts to me that the one who created all the universe says, I want to work with you. I want you on my team. You matter to me. Come and make eternal glory with me. You're invited to not just be at the show, but to be part of the show. You're on the stage. You're on the crew. Your work matters forever. Forever your work matters. But you're not just God's co-worker. You're also God's cause. You, your maturity, your spiritual transformation, who you are and who you are becoming matters to Jesus so much that he gave his life for you. Because your life 
matters to him. And he wants you to work with him, but he wants even more for you to know salvation through him. Not just the moment that you believe, but God's ongoing work of salvation in your life, saving you each day, showing you his glory each day. He's matter, you matter to him. You are his cause, right? God is working in you. You are his field and his building. He's sowing truth into you through people. He's watering that truth so it grows in you through people. And he is causing growth in you because your life matters. And he wants you to know him. He wants you to taste his glory. He wants you to sense his presence. He wants you to walk in his power. He wants you to gain his humility. He wants you to see heaven on earth. And so you are his cause. Paul is saying, won't you join the cause of Christ with me? Because you are Christ's cause. He wants you to work on this earth. And he wants you to function well. Your life matters to Jesus. And he wants to transform you. God is working with you and in you. Is that incredible? You wake up in the morning and think, this is a day that God's going to work in me. This is a day that God's going to work with me. He has plans to bring his glory and goodness into my life and for me to bring his glory and goodness into the world. And Paul says that you are like stars shining in the night. You are light in the darkness. In the midst of a wicked world, you are a point of excellence and divine good. So be good like Jesus is, he says. God is working with you and in you. And then Paul continues. He says, according to the grace that was given to me, I have laid a foundation as a skilled master builder, and another builds on it, but, to each, or, but each one is to be careful how he builds on it. For no one can lay any foundation other than what has been laid down. And that foundation is Jesus Christ. Got an extra slide in there. If anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, or costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become obvious, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test the quality of each one's work. And if anyone's work that he has built survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will experience loss, but he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Mindset shift number five. We are the building. We are God's worker. And Jesus is the judge of quality. Isn't that crazy? That, that we are the building and we are the workers, but Jesus is the judge of quality. Now, I, I really wanted to make this individual. You are the building. You are the workers. But the truth is, is it's corporate, right? We are the body of Christ, singular. We are the family of God, singular. We all function together. Later on, Paul's going to build on this truth. And he tells the Corinthian church, you are like a body, and the, the liver can't say to the toe, I don't like you. The eye can't say to the thumb, I'm more important than you. Every part of the body matters and each has work to do. We are the building and we are God's workers and we need to build according to his plans. Paul says there's different ways of building and working. And there's different qualities of building and working. And he says we all have to build on the foundation of Jesus. If you're not building on the foundation of Jesus, it just doesn't matter. And you can't lay a new foundation. There's only one sure foundation, and that sure foundation is Jesus. But if you're building on that, then the quality of your work will be shown. He says some are building with gold and silver and precious metals. And some are building with wood and hay and straw. He says, but they're all building on the foundation. But then he says that anyone's Everyone's work is going to be judged. Everyone's work is going to be judged. That's a sobering thought, right? That's a, that's a very, very challenging thought. That, that there's this, this point where everything that we do is going to be exposed. And that God is going to work and he's going to transform the quality of what's happened there. He's doing something with our work. He's purifying it. And he's judging us based on the quality of this work. But I want you to know that Jesus doesn't come in to judge in order to condemn. This isn't about condemnation, okay? This isn't the building inspector coming in the building process and shutting you down because you didn't do it right, right? It's not, he's not trying to delay your work. He's not trying to shut you down. He's actually judging to save, right? God doesn't let impurity into heaven. 
He just doesn't. He doesn't, he doesn't want it there. You don't want it there either, right? Just like you don't want impurity in your cooking. If you have a cat, where's the cat box? Kitchen counter? Why not? Quality control, man. <laughs> that stuff doesn't belong where my food is, right? Jesus is doing the same thing. He says there can't be impurity in heaven. Heaven is a perfect place. I only allow perfect things in. By the way, if you believe in Jesus, you're one of those perfect things. He says he made you perfect already. You're already clean. You're already washed. You're already holy. It's not about judgment for condemnation. It's judgment for salvation, and it's judgment for approval. He's coming to encourage you and reward you and save you from stuff that wasn't good enough. That's why he comes and he judges he doesn't come to judge to condemn you. He doesn't come to judge and condemn you, but he is the judge of the quality. You know what's amazing is that some of it will last. Some of it will be important. Do you, I don't know if this happened to you, but um, you, know, you move out of your parents' house and you come back later and there's like boxes of stuff and you're like, Where, what's this stuff? And they're like, it's stuff you left. Did this happen to you when you've gone home after college? And you're like, um, okay. Like, you're going to have to figure out what to do with it. You start going through it, and there's, like, first grade projects. And you're like, why, why, did, why do you have this, Mom? Like, what's going on? And then she's just like, you're just so precious to me. It was just such good work. And you're like, I, I don't even know what this is. And, 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 and they're like, it's your family. That's your dog, and that's your brother, and, that's, and it looks like Picasso, you know, on LSD. And you're like, I don't even know what I was doing in first grade. But mom, mom saw the work, and it was precious, and she judged it as quality. I think that we're going to feel like that in heaven. You know, we're going to, like, that? That was eternally amazing to you, God? I mean, where are all the moments that I thought I was awesome? I, this is not my best work, Jesus. And he's like, I'm the judge of quality here. I know what is eternally good. I know what is worthwhile. And these are the things that are presentable to my heavenly Father. They are pleasing to him. He's keeping those good things. He's coming because he wants to save us. Don't you know that you are God's temple and that the Spirit of God lives in you? Wow. If anyone destroys God temp God's temple... God will destroy him, for God's temple is holy, and that is what you are. You know, Paul here is making a strong contact, contrast. He said, I'm building like a master builder, an architect. He's saying there are other people who are trying to build in you, church, and, and they're not real builders. They're here to defraud you. There, there are people who want to come into the church because it's, it's about them, and they, they want it to be about them. Their heart is off. They bring in problems, they, they bring in fights, and, and they use politics to get their way instead of letting the Holy Spirit get their way, and, and, and it's unhealthy, and, it, and it's ungodly, but you know what? Sometimes it's really convincing, and sometimes they're amazing people who you want to trust, and it, and it makes it hard because we can lack discernment at times. Paul is saying there, there are people who are in your midst, and they're in your midst for their benefit, not yours and not for Jesus' benefit. And he's kind of laying down this significant phrase for them. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. Wow, that's tough. That's heavy. You know what it also says? You matter to God, church. That he will do what it takes to defend you, uphold you, protect you, save you, and care for you. He will pull you out of the fire at the cost of his own hand. He cares for you immensely, and he will protect you from those who want to destroy you, for you are his temple, and you are holy, chosen, perfect, and blameless before him, and he loves you. That's who you are. Isn't that an identity statement? He, he just said they're all a bunch of immature babies. Now what is he saying? But man, God loves you dirty diaper and all. In your eyes, he's ho you're holy. In his eyes, you're holy. In his eyes, you're amazing. He has good things to do in you. He's working with you. You're his temple. You're his field. You're his building. You're his coworkers. You're his servants. You're the ones he's growing because you matter to him. So Jesus is this judge, but he, he judges to protect and reward you. He doesn't condemn you. 
And you notice there's three dots at the end of that, okay? This is conditional, this lack of condemnation, right? If, if you don't have faith in Jesus, this statement isn't true. Jesus says you're condemned because of your unbelief. Not, not because of your sin, but because he came to save you and you wouldn't trust him. And so you, you're condemned because you won't trust him. I had the privilege in Boy Scouts of taking life-saving merit badges and becoming a, a certified lifeguard when I was a teenager. And there was this really daunting part of life-saving. My life-saving instructor was a, a 60-year-old Ukrainian man who had about 185 pounds on me. He's a big dude. I was 12. I was not a big dude. I was, I was actually a pretty scrawny kid growing up most of the time. And uh, he said, okay, here's the deal. When you're trying to save someone, you wouldn't believe it, but they fight you. They fight you. They are freaking out. They are panicking. And if they're conscious, conscious, usually they will try to use you to make themselves float by pulling you down and trying to push off on you. And if you're not careful, you will drown too. I don't know why. I know it was true for me. God was seeking after me. Jesus was seeking after me. And I was fighting him. I would not put my faith in Jesus. And then one day that all changed. God wrestled with me enough that I was exhausted and I realized that I needed Jesus and I put my faith in him and there, therefore I no longer stood condemned. If you're hearing this today, Jesus wants to save you. But if you fight him on it, just like a drowning victim in a pool, you can't be saved until you submit to him, until you put your faith in him. And that's all that it takes for salvation, by the way. And then you're no longer under condemnation. Then you're free. Then you're holy. Then Jesus is working in your life. Then you have eternity and everything in the world is yours, it says. So I just want to encourage you today. Put your faith in Jesus. Believe in him today. That's all it takes is for you to be convinced that Jesus will save you. And then he will save you. That guy, that beautiful, huge Ukrainian guy, for my lifeguarding final, I had to save him. And he went in the water, and he was pretending to drown, and I dove under him, and when I touched him, he exploded with a fight. I was going down. I had nothing. I could not save him. And I was fighting him, and he told me something before I did the test. He said, sometimes you just have to punch him in the face. And I was like, excuse me? And he's like, sometimes you just have to punch him in the face because if they're knocked out, then you're living and they're easier to save. So you know what I did? I was 12 and tiny, guys. It didn't hurt him. It didn't hurt him. It was like slow-mo underwater fighting. I mean, it was just, and then you, he let me save him. I could take him in. Now, the truth is, is that Jesus is more like the Ukrainian, and you're more like 12-year-old Chris, right? Jesus is able to save you, but you have to let him. You have to put your faith in him. You have to trust him, because he's a gentleman, because he cares about your will, oddly, just like he cares about mine. So if you don't want to be condemned, you need to trust in Christ. And if you trusted in Christ, Jesus doesn't come to condemn. He, he, he comes to save. He comes to protect you and reward you from the things that would make you less than he has made you to be. Then Paul continues, let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks he is wise in this age, let him become a fool so that he can become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. Since it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows that the reasonings of the wise are futile. So let no one boast in human leaders, for everything is yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come. Everything is yours, and you belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. Wow. Wow. Paul says, let go of all those things that aren't of Jesus. Let them go. They're not worth it. They don't matter. 
They're nothing compared to what God has for you. You think that by seeking the things in the world that you're going to gain the things that satisfy you, that bring you goodness in life. Paul says they're a trap. They're a lie. They're poison. They're going to harm you. They're not made to bless you and prosper you. Some of you are addicts in recovery. And some of you have known addicts in recovery. I'm an addict in recovery. And I remember the the thing that I was addicted to, I I thought it was bringing me life when I first started. I I thought it was amazing. I thought that life was better because of that. And then the thing is, is eventually life was worse because of it. In fact, life was terrible because of it. And every moment of life was spent trying to escape what was now obviously death. But the thing that brought death was the only thing that made life feel good anymore. It was terrible. It was horrible. It was lousy. I was losing everything in life. And then Jesus was like, stop, be done with this. And he moved me through a process of recovery and he probably saved my marriage in the midst of that, although my wife was incredibly patient and gracious with me in that period. And you know, I'm blessed because of that. And I'm thankful that God saved me from that. But sometimes I watch people without addictions and and I think, man, they're, they're just like I was. It's just that their addiction doesn't make them as sick as I got in my heart and in my mind. The allure of the world is amazing. And the allure of our world is incredible. We have so much. We're comfortable everywhere we go. It's hot out, I can make it cold inside. It's boring inside, I can turn on a TV or a radio to entertain me. I'm hungry, look, there's food in my fridge. If there's not food in my fridge, there's food at the store. If I don't have money, I can get credit. They'll lend me money, right? These, these things, it's like a fantasy that we're living in right now, this comfortable, amazing world that we live in. And that world is alluring, and it makes us feel like we're something and like everything's okay when it's so far from okay. And it doesn't just do that to unbelievers. It does it to Christians. We get lulled to spiritual sleep. We get allured into the world, and we enter into immaturity again and slavery to sin again. And we let go of Jesus for just a little bit of satisfaction now. And Paul says, man, become a fool for Christ's sake. Didn't mean that to sound like I was taking his name in vain. I really mean it for his sake, okay? Uh, Let go of the things of the world. Let go of the worldly values. Let go of those things that are going to make you sick. All of the things that you hope to gain, they're already yours in Christ. You know what he says? He says, everything is yours. Everything is yours. Paul and Apollos and and Cephas, everything is yours. The the ones that you want to define you, they're given to you by God to serve you because everything belongs to you because you are in Christ. You belong to Christ and Christ belongs to God and everything is God's. God has bigger and better plans for you. These plans include knowing Jesus and growing in Jesus and not just now, but forever and not just forever, But right now, Paul is saying, let Jesus mature you. Let him grow you. Don't hold on to the things that are making you like an infant in your faith. Get better. That story, I said I was sick, and I went back to school, and everyone was like, you look like you were going to die. I probably did look like I was going to die. But I didn't stay there. As you can see, I put on weight eventually and muscle and I started to get better because I stopped living like a sick person and started seeking the things that were going to make me healthy. That happened in January. I graduated senior year and I didn't just weigh 135 pounds. I weighed 147 and a half pounds. So somehow God used that sickness and I started to put on muscle, which was something I could never do as a kid. I was skinny as a rail. I would go to work. I worked in a retirement home in the kitchen and I would get done with school and the cook would make me a double bacon cheeseburger and an order of fries because she's like, you need to put some meat on your bones. And I would eat all that and then I would eat dinner too. And you know what didn't happen? I didn't put on weight. I couldn't put on weight. I would lift weights every day. I hung out with the coaches. I mean, I was skinny as a rail. But God used the exposure to that sickness to actually grow me into somebody who was stronger and better. And that's what God wants to do with the sickness in the Corinthian church. And that's what God wants to do with the sickness in your life. 
He wants to use the suffering that you're in so that you would hold on to Jesus and so that you would grow into something and someone that is bigger and better. And that is true when churches are sick and that is true in marriages that are sick because what is he trying to do? He's trying to make it so that you know Jesus and that you grow in Jesus and that you display that Jesus now and forever because that is the biggest and the best plan that any human can have. Let's pray. Father, may we be convinced, not just now, but each day, that you are working in our lives, that you have brought us to the place that we are so that we can know you in the midst of that, whether that's a beautiful place or whether it's a dark place. You say that you are with us in the valley of the shadow of death. And then you say that you lead us to wide pastures and green fields and cool, refreshing waters. And all of this I know, Father, is so that we can know you, and so that we can make you known. So, Father, in the midst of everywhere we are, would you show yourself to us? Would you remind us to let go of the things that are not of you that we think will save us so that we can be saved by you and you alone? We thank you, God, that you're working your salvation out, your plans out in our midst, even before we know it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand as we sing this final song, please? We so enjoyed having you today. You're dismissed. Hey, everyone. Thank you for choosing to spend your Sunday morning with us here at Peninsula Baptist Church. 
You can visit our website at pbchome.org to learn more about who we are as a church and what we believe. We would love to be able to connect with you more, um, and you can help us uh, by taking a moment to fill out a communication card at pbchome.org connect. Additionally, if you have questions for us or would like to request prayer, you can do that there as well. Please consider liking this video and giving our channel a follow so you know when we post more. Thank you again for joining us and we hope to see you next week.